Good afternoon. Glad to see students here. We're so busy here sometimes, I think it's hard to see the forest for the trees. I think that we're aware that there are fearless new leaders and that uh, they, we, have invited certain visitors and lecturers. But I don't think that we're always entirely aware of the greater vision at play or the true revolutions happening within our field and emanating from here, our little ecosystem of SciArc. And um, it's always struck me as ironic that during the critical period in architecture, meaning from the 1970s on, when everyone was reading Derrida and Lacan, architectural education and especially undergraduate education was becoming increasingly sociological and behaviorally scientific. And that seemed like a contradiction or at least a miscue. And with the advent of pervasive computing, education actually became more data specific and it was not otherwise greatly inflected by the accompanying wonderful changes in worldview and digital platforms that the matrix worlds have now revealed to us. And so here now, we are setting out to change what we thought we knew or understood was foundational thinking for architecture. We are embracing liberal arts. Tom Wiscombe, our fearless leader in the undergraduate program, has rightly pointed out that we should not be educating our students only for a vocation, and that if we're truly interested in student success, then the burden is on us to make those students, you, better thinkers, deeper thinkers, and more speculative thinkers, and to give you a high quality background in which to do that. So to achieve this great ambition, this is the second of our liberal arts masterclasses, and we're honored to be led this time and inspired by Dr. Timothy Morton. Dr. Morton is the Rita Shea Guffey Chair in English at Rice University and the author of a lovely range of texts that move from Victorian diets and English Gothic novels of the 19th century to dark ecology to hyper objects and of course uh, everything those hyper objects stick to. As a philosopher, Dr. Morton is both a delightful read and what I call a multi-platform voice consistently breaking from the traditions of Western metaphysics and academia in both thought and action. I'm particularly happy to welcome him here today to kick off the master class for Dr. Morton has taught us already so much. Most importantly this, that there are forests and trees and trees that make forests and forests without trees and all combined what we see, what we say we see, trees, forests causes neither forest nor tree as much as it causes us. Please welcome Dr. Morton. Oh, thank you. Gosh, it's, very, it's so touching when you get such a lovely introduction like that. Um, I'm hoping that this mic is on because I tend to do this and then I'm not illuminated, sorry. Mm. The elixir of life. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm deeply touched to have been invited here. And um, the talk that I'm giving to, to you um, to start off with is called um, Philosophy is Design is Philosophy. Thought is only one access mode among others. Therefore, it's perfectly possible to conceive of an assemblage of non-thought entities that would access a topic such as sadness or the state of the world economy. A building, for instance. I really mean this, and I mean it quite strongly. There's nothing particularly special about human thought. I'm putting that in brackets. It's a bit hard to pronounce brackets. Human thought that makes it a privileged access domain. Thinking that it is so generates a certain range of constraints on thought itself that we might call epistemism. Epistemism could be considered to be a region within anthropocentrism. According to epistemism, thought is the top-level access mode, and epistemology is thus the top-level philosophical mode. Of course, I hold that ontology is the basic philosophical mode, and that thought in general, ontology means, you know, like, if things exist, then how do they exist, basically? 
um, I, I hold that ontology is the basic philosophical mode and that thought in general um, isn't privileged among entities as access modes. This has another consequence. Seeing everything, even being right, are highly overrated, I hope, as you'll find out as I carry on opening my big mouth. Highly overrated. We need to start taking some risks. Otherwise, we'll never get around to handling frogs and silt with our thoughts. Only with our highways, ironically, imagining thought to be top and epistemism to be the penthouse of thought means that other human access modes get to carry on relatively undisturbed by human thought. These access modes are not exactly great for life forms, including humans, at this point. Some of them are built on totally unexamined inner logics that have been allowed to persist as the access software, often called civilization, just excuses its logistical code for very long, ju just executes its logistical code for very long durations, in this case, 12 and a half thousand years. Writing about music is always like dancing about architecture. Thinking about music is also like raining about glass, philosophizing about design, designing about philosophy. Why not? It's intuitive, no? I mean, dancing out about architecture is exactly what we do every day when we walk through it. As Viktor Shklovsky put it, a dance is simply a walk that is felt. Since there's no top-level access mode, since even an interview by some sentient building that made it onto Oprah wouldn't be the building, but instead building autobiographical stuff, the fact that you could dance about architecture or architecture about dance, and that's all you ever do, is just fine. Well, I came to consciousness being discussed by this philosopher. It was traumatic birth, Oprah. Thank you for laughing. It's very good for my ego. This means that to be a thing is to be never quite completely accessible. That doesn't mean that if you fast forward the time of the universe, you'll eventually see the whole thing. That means never. To be a thing is to be open. Because to be a thing is in part to be the future. So be careful what you design because you're designing for an intrinsically unpredictable future. And you have to build this unpredictability into your design. If you build total accessibility into your design, and I'm not talking about disability issues here, be careful, then you will make a building that excludes, that exudes violence in some way, whether social, psychic, or philosophical, or some mixture of all these. And how buildings appear is the past. Buildings are not in some one-size-fits-all time box. They directly are the past. They construct temporality. They are temporality structures. John Ruskin has that beautiful phrase, the stain of time. He argues that stripping this temporal stain off of a building is an act of violence. And what I'm explaining would be why. You're basically never restoring the building to some original state. You're reformatting it according to some other temporality format based on some other kind of project, which might be great or not. Just be honest about it. Architects make things that have very obvious temporal parts, those aspects of an object that last to varying degrees and at all kinds of scales. So architects should be able to intuit this stuff about time better than some other kinds of professional. Architecture is a place where we think not only about more or less predictable future, but about the possibility of a future at all, futurality. In this respect, Architecture does what philosophy does in a different key. Making a building and thinking about a building are surprisingly similar and neither exhaust the reality of a building. Our ecological age is one in which the possibility of the future has become a question that now haunts us as never before. This is for a very simple reason, as a matter of fact. The reason is that ecological awareness means precisely thinking about life forms on this planet on a variety of scales, scales that are both temporal and spatial. In addition to this, which is already bewildering and disorienting, there is the further fact, to add insult to injury, as it were, insult to anthropocentrism, that is, there is no top scale, 
No one scale to rule them all. No particular scale on which things can be accessed accurately. A decade, a century, a millennium, a million years, nanoseconds, the time of photosynthesis. Minutes, likewise, at what spatial scale are we operating? Blade of grass, lawn, suburb, city, megacity sprawl, bioregion, solar system? Sorry, I sort of turned into Michael Caine a little bit. It's not happening very much now, but I'm, I'm sort of warning you. Solar system? Oh, wait. Solar system? <laughs> now, until recently, concentrate, Tim, and this is really quite funny when you think about it, we thought we had this scale stuff down. You can visit all kinds of websites that automate the scaling process, and they're very reassuring, because they give you a glimmer of the old anthropocentric one scale to rule them all. Subtly, and at the level of form, by having you be in charge of the mouse or trackpad that does the zooming in and out, from the Planck length to the size of the measurable universe. Perhaps the derangement of scale that is a daily reality, experientially, politically, in design world, psychologically, perhaps this derangement is precisely what's pushing the creation of all those scale tools. You must have seen them, yeah? You've got this, don't panic. You've got the world at your fingertips. See, it's just like before, only now you have only to glide your finger, and presto, we descend from the scale of a soccer ball to that of an electron, in a nice smooth glide with no jumps. That's another thing about the scale derangement. There are no smooth continua between scales. It's like you zoom out a bit, and pow, you find yourself in a totally different reality altogether. There's a nice, neat, monotheistic holism implied by the scale tool. Everything fits from the tiniest vibrating string upwards into your monitor, which encompasses them as if to say, reassuringly, as we've been telling ourselves over and over for 12,500 years, the whole is always bigger than the sum of its parts. This is exactly the holism that has just collapsed. All those emergentist fantasies, you know, emergence, right? It's a cool word, yeah? You have to say it sometimes or something bad happens, apparently. All those emerges, emergent, I can't even say it, emergentist fantasies of beings such as Gaia, thanks Latour, are exactly not what planet Earth or being on planet Earth is or is like. Not that there isn't a whole, but that we've been getting holism deeply wrong because of a certain monotheism born of a certain agricultural logistics. Ecological awareness means designing things on a variety of timescales, none of which is the correct one. This results in a number of amazing paradoxes. Most notable is that the present doesn't exist. Ecological awareness requires us to think and make and coexist alongside this thought. What is called present is nothing but the slidey relative motion between potentially infinite past, which shows up as how things appear, and potentially infinite future, which shows up in the mode of what things are. It's like being in a junction station with a sliver of platform, or none at all, experiencing a weird relative motion as the trains slide past one another in different directions. The present can be arbitrarily specified to optimal context-driven project needs, which in most cases mean that our presence and our very idea of the present and of presence are deeply anthropocentric which is exactly how we can't think anymore, not with a straight face anyway. We need to be thinking in a different mode altogether. We need to be thinking without recourse to an anthropocentrically scaled present, which ultimately means letting go of the, you know why, right? Because not just because it's nice to be, it's good to be nice to polar bears and all that, but because like there's so much more not Tim Morton DNA here for example, in my bacterial microbiome, then there is Tim DNA in order for Tim to exist. It's stuff like that, right? We need to be thinking without recourse to an anthropocentrically scaled present. Which ultimately means letting go of the concept of present and of presence. What happens to objects when we give this a try? Remember that when I say object, I don't just mean pencils and planets, I mean thoughts. Hyperobjects such as climate, mathematical formulae, 
actually the hyperobject is a great concept for defeating the idea of a graspable, anthropocentrically scaled present. When we think in this new, unfamiliar, but much more accurate way, a way that's also nicer to other life forms, we encounter objects in the same kind of way that we encounter chronic disease. I'm going to say something again because it bears repeating. Actually, I'm going to emphasize something you may have missed. I'm talking about thinking. We can think. It's okay. This is an ecological catastrophe, and all of our reference points are not only irrelevant, they're key to perpetuating the catastrophe, including the reference point of how we think about thinking itself. But that's okay. We can think. It's perfectly possible. You don't have to go ape or just roll around screaming for mercy or retreat into a world of affect or agency or resistance and whatever weirdly bland Vaseline is being held up at the moment as the one true salve for finding it difficult to put ideas together. You can breathe this oxygen. You can, you can operate logically in this domain without losing anything that's special about it. Exiting from Western civilization, which is kind of what we're pussyfooting around here, doesn't require you to be, have to be illogical or alogical. You can be perfectly logical outside of Western civilization. Just ask someone who's outside of Western civilization. So, okay, we can think. And we can think objects without presence. Because this without presence doesn't mean does not exist or is merely an artifact of something that is really is present, such as subject or class relations. So when we think an object without the normal anthropocentric time-space blinkers on, we discover that an object is a syndrome. An object is a kind of objectitis. Every object suffers from this syndrome, which, is, which in philosophical speech means that every object is a temporality structure, not a thing in time, but a thing that leaks out time where everywhere and resonates or not with other objects, other syndromes. I might have the flu and stomach cancer at the same time. Consider the simple sounding condition arthritis. Acute illnesses are easy to point to. You have a certain temperature, you think they're easy, right? You have a certain temperature, you have white spots on the back of your throat, a culture grown in a lab tells the physician that you have strep. But a chronic illness such as arthritis is a lot more tricksy you have aches and pains in your joints. Sometimes they are there, sometimes they aren't. Sometimes it's just a twinge. Sometimes you can hardly move your hip. Sometimes you use them to pretend to get off work. <laughs> Syndromes have a very disorienting property, which anyone familiar with them knows about. This property makes them flit in and out of time. A thing has temporal as well as spatial parts, as I was just saying. For instance, a glass has all kinds of ridges and moldings that look cool and allow you to hold it and so on. These are the spatial parts. But there is also the glass when it was a molten blob at the end of some glass blower's blowing tube in a factory near Venice. When you examine the temporal parts of a thing close up, let's say you choose a one hour time window to study the arthritic condition, you might not be able to discern it at all. When you look closely at a thing, as we know from quantum theory, you can't quite see it, because seeing at this level means adjusting. You are splashing a photon onto an electron, and so on. Extensional space as such, because it is made of things, has a determinate limit. It's not infinitesimally divisible. Space as such is quantized, and who knows, now we know there are gravity waves, we might be closer to finding the little jiggling things that structure space-time, aka gravitons. Space-time itself isn't a void, but another kind of syndrome. If and when we find out about it in detail, we will find that it has a very specific frequency, for example. The Higgs field is a quantum ocean that all kinds of sub-oceans are floating in, electron oceans, proton oceans, gluon oceans, and so on. The Higgs field, like any field, has a specific frequency. Let's say it's yellow, or it's F sharp, or it tastes of chicken. We can say that kind of thing, because we're not in Geneva right now. It's like arthritis. Even though it's not possible to point to arthritis directly, arthritis isn't breast cancer. It is just this very specific syndrome with these and those very unique qualities. A thing syndrome at the smallest possible scale uh, um, starts becoming violently ambiguous. And from a temporal distance, it's fleeting. 
The glass is just an eyelash flutter in the history of the Venetian factory. I once did a project with this Australian artist, he's a nano artist, called Paul Thomas, which we called Kissing in the Shadow. It was based on a simple alg algorithm, an algorithm being a recipe for creating a certain kind of formalized syndrome along the lines we've been exploring. The algorithm had three steps, pretty much. One, take your iPhone. Two, accompany Paul Thomas down King Street in Newtown, Sydney in August 2012. Three, take photographs of the spaces between buildings. After about two hours of running this algorithm, you begin to wonder how Paul Thomas makes it across the street, such as the immense intensity of his immensely decelerated attention. If you walk too slowly down the street, you find yourself caught in the honey of aesthetic zones emitted by thousands and thousands of beings. If you want to get from A to B, you'd better hurry up. Is there any space between anything? Do we not, when we look for such a space, encounter a plenitude of other things? A slice of plaster, an old vinyl record, a flattened piece of aluminum, painted metal surfaces, nameless interstitial powder, the reflection of sky, some letters on, of the alphabet, roughened concrete. Between what we take to be things, there exist other things, as if the universe were jammed with entities like clowns in a crowded expressionist painting. An abyss of things that emanates from them, not a yawning void that threatens to engulf them, but a sunlit nothingness filled with dust that seems to spray out of them like dry mist, sparkling with firefly swarms. In these so-called spaces, we encounter the work of causality. Look, someone painted over this crack, some sunlight rippled in a mirage, a hole appeared. When we look for causes and effects, we don't encounter a basement of efficient, whirring machinery. Rather, we encounter these in-between spaces where we had thought not to look. What we see are stagehands moving the scenery about. They're doing it in plain sight, the best place to hide right in front of you in the place we call the aesthetic dimension. In Tibetan Buddhism, these spaces are called bardo, which just means the between. There is no such thing as a moment of your life that is not a between, according to this view. There is the between of living. There is the between of dying. There is the between of the transition between lives. There is the between of dreaming. There is the between of meditation. There is the between of two humans holding cameras walking down a street in Sydney. The between of two buildings, a space bursting with objects as if a billion jack-in-the-boxes had exploded at once. Some of the lids are stuck, sometimes a nose bursts out and the hinge won't open any further. At other times the jack-in-the-box flies right out and pulps against the wall on the opposite side of the room. Time opens up. Each surface is a poem about the past. A myriad stories begin to pr proliferate as if a thing were a crisscrossing of books, a whole library of them, each page whispering parts of paragraphs and broken pieces of word. The stories tell us things. They're quite literal. Look, this guy painted part of this wall and they came and stripped off the panel and touched up the holes. Form is the past. When you look at appearance, you're looking at the past. Where is the present? An essence is the future. The hints of unknown, unseen things, the absolute impossibility of grasping everything about this plastic pipe, the way photons entering the camera lens obey a speed limit and splash onto receptors going into and out of coherence. At the electronic level, it's quite clear that causality is aesthetic. I can't see an electron without deflecting it. Everything is a refrigerator with a light on or off inside. For me, for you, for this arrangement of tiles sandwiched between a door and a slab of marble. To be a photon, an electron, is a refrigerate to a photon, sorry, to a photon, an electron is a refrigerator with a closed door and a light that might be on or off inside. How can you know whether the light is on inside? Why, you open the door, of course, but then you're looking at the past. You never see the light in the refrigerator before you open the door. This future is not a predictable future that is a specific number of now points away. You will never reach it. You will never be able to sneak up from the side and see through the refrigerator. Nor can a photon see through the refrigerator of an electron. Nor can paint see through the refrigerator of this plastic pipe. You take a photo, click. 
The past appears, another open refrigerator. But the thing you've just made, the photograph, the graphing of the photons, it's another thing, another story. You can read the words, but the meaning always eludes you. It always lurks just off the edge of the sentence, just at the very edge of this ragged slice of paint, just at the edge of this building between this one and that one. Thousands of secrets everywhere. Masks that lie and tell the truth at the same time. This pink paint isn't blue paint, that's true. But the thing, the thing in itself, that paint sliding off a brush onto that pipe, it's somewhere, it's nowhere to be seen, like a light behind a closed door. When you walk too slowly down the street, you start walking into millions of levels of pastness, levels emitted not just by the humans or the dogs and cats, but also by this garbage can, this mottled pink surface pockmarked with nail holes. You walk surrounded by as many futures as there are things. You walk, or rather you occupy, a peculiar shifting ground of nowness, created by the relative motion of the past sliding against the future, not touching. You begin to realize that the present doesn't exist. A thing is a train station, as I was saying, a train station where one train is always arriving and one train is always leaving. Hundreds of train stations everywhere, hundreds of relative motions. The idea of a universal, regular, atomic sequence of instants that contains everything is absolutely ludicrous. The philosophers have known this for thousands of years, and to hide the absurdity, to get from A to B, Houston to Sydney, crossing the international date line without too much laughter, you have embedded piezoelectric devices in as many pieces of hardware as possible. Devices in which quartz talks to electrons, making train stations where the trains seem to run on time. When you walk too slowly down the street, you begin to realize that Zeno had a point. You can seemingly divide each moment, each step, infinitesimally, so perhaps there are no moments, no steps, or perhaps time is not a box that everything goes in. Perhaps time, as Einstein argued after all, is a way that things send out ripples. I was so happy a couple of weeks ago because this guy um, who runs the... Um, Laser Interferometry Gra uh, Gravitational Observatory, LIGO, stood up in front of the cameras and said, in DC, I said, ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravity waves. Super, super, super good that that happened. Where one house touches another house, there arise hundreds of things, hundreds of meeting places. Old English thing means meeting place. Hundreds of times, I have a thing for you, Come over here, let's do a thing. Stay in the sunlight and shadow between worlds in the sunlit ca canyon between this building and that building. See how paint touches this pipe, caressing them, leaving no one will notice if a surface is left exposed, not quite filled in. See how shadows are reflected in pale cream glass. See the luminous abyss of causality spreading out before your very eyes right in front of security. All kinds of beautiful crimes are committed right here, and as American cars keep telling you, and you never notice, objects in mirror are closer than they appear. They are here, or rather here is them, and now is them, kissing in the shadow. There is only really one reason why things appear to be stable and present and capable of being pointed at. The anthropocentric scale is where a thing appears constantly present because we've set it up that way. But constant presence as an indicator of existence is just an artifact of this anthropocentric scaling. Once you know that, you can't unknow it. This means that the metaphysics of presence is most definitely an anthropocentric artifact. So anthropocentric means you've drawn an arbitrary and in no sense sustainable line between the human and everything else. Why would you want to do that? You want to do it because of a syndrome, AKA a thing, as we were exploring. A thing that's been running in the background like an operating system. This thing is an assemblage of all kinds of psychic, philosophical, and social sub-syndromes. It's a design, aka a philosophical concept extended in built space, aka some kind of tweet, a concept that has a very distinctive frequency and flavor. I'm calling it agri-logistics. Agri-logistics consists of three logical axioms that whir away implicitly in the background like OS X. Number one, thou shalt not violate the law of non-contradiction. Number two, to exist is to be constantly present. Number three, existing is always better than any quality of existing. 
They're all interrelated, but I number them like that because number one, thou shalt not violate the law of non-contradiction, is the most important and implies the metaphysics of presence, which implies a default utilitarianism. And implies means something a bit terrifying. It means that these axioms have been hardwired into social space for thousands of years, which means that they're very difficult to detect and that dismantling them requires dismantling the top-level social space that we've been creating and recreating in all kinds of ways, le plus ça change, le plus c'est la même chose, for thousands of years. That's part of the problem. When we relax the anthropocentric scaling just a bit, all kinds of things start to happen. The chiasmic queasiness of this title of this lecture is meant to convey some of this floating future, this futurality, this uncertain horizon, which is always perforated. You see, we actually do have an inkling of what Kant calls the thing in itself, or what OOO calls objects. Of course we do. You're listening to this sentence, no? Got it? How else could we know the thing in itself? There is precisely an aesthetic of how we can know this, an experiential aspect to it. I try to show you number, for example, and what I end up with is pointing at my fingers, which is called counting, not number. But I know number exists intuitively. It's just that what's making them real in themselves um, isn't some George Bush-like... It's, it's just that what's making them real is themselves, not some George Bush-like decider thingy that has something to do with my human being, such as thought or human economic relations or the spirit of the age. It's aesthetic. It's experiential. That's why Kant calls it, in the first section calls the first section of the Critique of Pure Reason the transcendental aesthetic. But the barrier between things and thing data is usually construed as incredibly rigid. Nothing can leak through. For instance, we've all learned from Lacan, who gets it from structuralism, that there is an insurmountable barrier between the symbolic, the regime of the sign, and the real, the referent. The maddening circularity of structuralist language a referent is that to which the sign refers, a sign is that of which the referent is the referent, is a symptom of this tightness and impermeability, as if Lacan's famous barrier were made of very durable plastic designed to outlast every human who ever looked at it, thus giving rise to the idea that it's permanent and solid and, of course, true. But really, it's just a very stiff barrier, based on a very stiff correlationist reading of Kant. Very stiff because very nervous. Nervous of Kant's gap between things and thing data. This gap must happen not in reality, but in my apprehension of it, says Hegel. And Lacan is basically retweeting Hegel on this particular point. I'm all for weak correlationism. That's cool. That just means that I'm prepared to mess with finitude. I respect the difference between things and thing data. You know, like... This is Kant's example, right? There are raindrops, right? But you can't access the actual raindrop. What you're accessing is like wetness and sphericalness and splashiness. And these are all data that you can get from the raindrop. Not just like math-type data, but just all kinds of stuff that's given to you. But those aren't the raindrop, right? And like I was saying earlier about something else, if, if, if the raindrop were to somehow develop the ability to speak, and like a Muppet raindrop somehow, and it went on Oprah, you know, it wouldn't actually reveal itself on Oprah. It, it would do raindrop autobiographical stuff that also wouldn't be the rain. Even the raindrop doesn't know the raindrop. Even if the raindrop became a Zen master, the raindrop wouldn't know the rain. In fact, being a Zen master raindrop would, would be knowing that you can't know the raindrop, right? But really, it's just a very stiff barrier. Okay, I'm all for weak correlationism. I respect the difference between things and thing data. But the strong stuff, a panic reaction to Kant's panic reaction, because Kant himself is terrified by that idea. So he restricts the thing in itself to stuff that you can measure mathematically, extensionally. Like, it's yay big and it's yay long-lasting. Not like it's pink or it reminds me of my grandma. But there's no reason to do that, according to his own logic. And his own analogy doesn't do that. What was I saying? But the strong stuff, the panic reaction to Kant's react panic reaction, bombs thinking back to the Stone Age, literally because it's in the Neolithic that the rigid boundary between the human and the non-human, which is what is powering the structuralist binary between the symbolic and the real, goes into effect. The Hegelian panic is basically saying, yes, there's a rigid barrier, and we made it, and a bloody good thing too. We can't just let anything in. They might not be Hegelians, for example. Maybe Hegel was like the Trump of, of uh, post-Kantian philosophy. 
Both had funny hair. The clue is in the notion of the symbolic itself. It's sort of informationist. It privileges a certain way of looking at what we do. We are the signing animals, zoon, logon, ekon, the thinking or logical or wordy animal, as Aristotle says. We have the conch. We have the controls. What's real is produced by language itself, cutting into an undifferentiated continuum. Shh, don't mention that you need a pre or non-human undifferentiated continuum for this to work. This is what leads postmodernism to glorify information, as in Lyotard's famous exhibition at the Centre Pompidou, Les Immatérieurs. This barrier is also deeply circular in the way I've just described. The two things on either side entail one another. What actually happens in the realm of information? Funnily enough, what happens is that things are far from slippy and slidey and all that good post-structuralist stuff. We know now because we've been running Facebook and Google for years. That realm is much more like what Tibetan Buddhism says about what happens after death, to go back to that topic. You enter the bardo, a space between lives, and you have no body. What you have are your thoughts, which always have some kind of intensity or momentum to them. They're not concepts in a void. They're like tweets. And they're floating around, hassling you, just like actual tweets in the Twitter sphere. We know that now about sentences. They really are memes, entities in their own right. Just consider a tweet. Disembodied emotion actually means horribly reified emotion, a phenomenological reduction of the body in social space. In information space, I'm stripped of my embodiment by an algorithm that is, of course, an automated human emotion. Just consider the stock market. The algorithms that make it run are basically automated fear. When you think about it that way, it's not so great. I don't float freely in info space. I'm tied because there is no difference between information and my embodiment. Of course, this all sounded really utopian in the mid-80s when Lyotard designed that exhibition and through the 90s when the internet leaked out of the academy. But as we know, we've transitioned somewhere from a utopian be-anything-you-want-to-be space to a dystopian superego space. Something is distorting this realm from within. There are no easy-to-find ironic gaps in this space. Perhaps this finally will convince us that you find irony in a downwards direction towards the body rather than upwards towards greater and giddier info heights. To introduce gaps into the Twitter sphere requires real skill because one has to play its games in such a way as to open a trap door into the physical. What is distorting information space from within? It's easy. It's a deep Western philosophical fear of movement. So easy to identify that I've started calling it kinephobia. Most philosophers seem hell-bent on trying to get rid of movement. It's only a phenomenon. It's not deeply part of how things are. It's just the way things occupy different places at different times. All the way up to, it's a complete illusion, Zeno and Parmenides. I'm now beginning to wonder whether all those moving symbols on your computer, wheels of color, bars, egg timers, and so on, all those graphics we see when some process such as a page loading is occurring are there to convince us that movement is happening in a technological space that apes the kinephobic space of Western philosophy, a space where automation and the computation that enables it is precisely in the business of closing off the radical, unpredictable future on which the computable future depends, unless it's just literally going to repeat the past. Design is philosophy means exactly that the open future is the one you need to be channeling. Remember the days of a thing called Netscape Navigator and its ship's wheel evoking fantasies of this unthinkable beyond, this realm below the horizon. In other words, a perforated world, a world not totally sealed off from everything else. Thinking is not tweeting and things are not made of quantized blobs of color. It's the physical that is the realm of uncertainty. There we see we got rid of the metaphysics of presence, so actually what we're dealing with is deep uncertainty when it comes to physical stuff. There we encounter life, not rigidly in opposition to death, but as a spectral quivering between two different types of death, non-existence and automation, mechanical repetition. There's always more to the physical realm than meets the computational eye, which is why logical systems, aka algorithms, aka apps, must be flawed in order to work. Failure is never just an option. It's a feature, not a bug. 
And more deeply, this is because physical things are also ontologically fragile in the exact same way. They're flawed because they are what they are, yet they never are as they appear. And this duality gives us all we need to imagine things exactly as quantum the the uh, theory sees them, as shimmering without mechanical input, without being pushed. That's the minimalist unit of movement, this quivering or dancing without going from A to B. This always more than meets the eye quality is so much weirder than it sounds to say. When you think it through, it means you have to get, let go of a heck of a tweet, a monotheist holism in which the whole is always bigger than the sum of its parts. What you have to accept instead sounds so counterintuitive that you immediately want to delete it, but I assure you that it's child's play to think, and it's very empowering, and here it comes. You're only supposed to blow the blood. No, not that one. The whole is always less than the sum. Less the whole is always. Let's see, Michael Caine comes out. The whole is always less, less than the sum of its parts. The whole is always less than the sum of its parts. Here's an architectural example. Been trying to point to megacities recently? Having trouble? There are two possibilities. There are no megacities, which would be odd to tell the residents of LA or Houston. Or we've been looking for megacities in the wrong place. We've been trying to find a hole that transcends the parts of LA or Houston. But what if there were always more in LA than there was of LA, if you see what I mean? It's very obvious in Houston, where hibiscus flowers erupt through broken pavements beneath sagging electricity cables and slick, muddy clay makes you slip into the gutter. There is this uncontainable wildness in which Houston is sort of bursting out of itself all the time. Some people are in the favor of uh, there are no megacities option, but this is just giving in to unjustifiable reductionism in the face of the problem. And if you carry on like that, there are no cities at all, and no clouds, meadows, or for that matter, life forms, because pretty much everything, it turns out, is like a megacity, and not like a component of Gaia. I'm calling this weird holism subsendence. Subsendence, right? Uh, like transcendence, but with sub at the beginning, yeah? Subsendence, and it's like upside-down transcendence, where the ironic gap is found downwards in the profusion of members of a set exceeding the set itself, which is unthinkable if you hold tight to the law of non-contradiction. Consider weather. It's a symptom of global warming. All of it. But it's so much more than that. It's this wet patch on my pants as I get up from this bench. It's this bath for these birds over there. It's this hot droplet causing a tongue to enjoy itself. Global warming is a hyperobject, but don't be scared, because while it's physically and temporally huge, it's ontologically tiny. So design is philosophy to the extent that designed things subsend the design and the designer. You can use a chair as a hammer. And philosophy is the love of wisdom which means you're slipping and sliding and finding out all kinds of things you had no idea about while having the curious Socratic sensation of knowing nothing at all. So philosophy subsends wisdom. That all we can do is dance about architecture doesn't mean anything goes or we can't think or speak at all. What it means, now that we can revisit it and restate it much more fully, is that the world is perforated. I can relate to a lion or a block of metal. We're not vacuum sealed from one another. Things can happen. Things are possible. You can hope. There is a future different from now for real. Thank you very much. Sort of upbeat ending now. I'm obviously super happy to talk about stuff. Is that the... Is that the... Great, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you so much for a great lecture. That it's was, my pleasure. That was really awesome. It's my pleasure. <laughs> um, I have a question about uh, the, the megacity analogy yeah. to a, like a perforation of cognition or, or co cognition acting as a sort of transparency. Mm. Um, if you could just elaborate on how you imagine the megacity mega as um, relative points of information or, uh, like, reactive information? Um, that's sort of what I'm, I'm not imagining it like that right now. 
I'm imagining it. I mean, I, you, I think you probably could, right? But I'm imagining it as a physical entity right now. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about houses and streets and roads, and I'm also thinking about like traffic rules and zoning and politics and some things that aren't physical, right? Um, and what I'm thinking is that there's so many more of those things than there are of the thing, right? And this is intuitively true of megacities because it's become very difficult to find out where do they start and stop and what constitutes them. And they kind of reorganize your mind about what cities are in general. And in fact, so strange was this way of thinking about them that they reorganized my mind about what anything was at all, right? So for example, um, to take the example of this thing again, there's much more in this thing than there is Tim stuff, right? On every possible, in every possible respect, right? Um, and we sort of know this if we've seen Doctor Who. You know Doctor Who? I'm probably the only nerdy person in the room who knows Doctor Who. Thank goodness for that. Because I'm now going to say the word TARDIS and hopefully you'll understand. So Doctor Who's spaceship is, is called the TARDIS, Time and Relative Dimension in Space. And it's famously bigger on the inside, right? It's got millions, possibly infinity, rooms. It's got thousands of control rooms and like hundreds of wardrobes and beds and stuff. And the companions run around and going, oh my god. It's bigger on the inside. So kind of Kant, right, and, and contemporary philosophy in general, has found that out about one tiny little thing in the universe. It's called human beings, right? Human being is a TARDIS because we contain an in infinity that's obviously therefore bigger than the universe. It's easy to find out. Count up to infinity now. One, two, three, go. Nine, 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 nine. Did you get that yet? Nine, 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 nine. Oh my God, he gave us an impossible exercise. I can't do it. Ah, but that's what infinity is. It's something that you can't count up to. So I can understand infinity. Oh my God, I'm a TARDIS. I'm bigger on the inside. I don't have to believe George III. Vive la révolution. I'm not just a subject of the monarch. I subsend him, funnily enough. There's so much more in me than there is of just being like... An, my passport is just doesn't define everything that I am, and all that. So object-oriented ontology is basically saying everything's like that. That's incredibly, it's an incredibly default, super cheap, wonderful thing about reality that it's like that, which is awesome politically, actually, because, for example, neoliberalism, right? Pretty much all of Earth's surface is now covered with what I take to be agri-logistics 9.0, a.k.a. neoliberalism. It's a particularly virulent, nasty form of it that is causing the sixth mass extinction on our planet right now, thanks to fossil fuels, yeah? So it's big and bad and scary, and like my job as an intellectual usually is to tell you that it's so big and bad and scary that you can't possibly do anything about it, and that's why I'm so clever, right? Like I'm more intelligent than you because I'm so much more capable of disempowering you than you are. Like what? Why is that intelligent? Like, that's called cynical reason, but it's because of epistemism, which I was talking about at the beginning. It's like the top level of being right for the last 200 years is, I'm smarter than you because I can see through you, right? Well, kind of that's what you can't do, according to the logic I've been sketching out. You can't actually do that, right? There's no ultimate Monty Python policeman to arrest all the other policemen and all the characters in the argument sketch. It's just, you're just not going to find that policeman. There's no top level, yeah? Or as Lacan would say, there is no meta-language. It's kind of the same thing, yeah? Because of that, you know, this sort of disempowering threat display that, that, that some people take to be Hegelian Marxism, it's, it's, it's not only very disempowering, it's completely incorrect. Because actually, neoliberalism is physically and spatially huge, but ontologically tiny. You've got the controls, there's so much more of us and you than there is of that, right? And we sort of know this intuitively now. You know, like the Cecil the Lion episode that happened? You know, like some of that was animal rights and some of that was sentimental stuff, but there was something else going on, I think, something kind of underneath that, something that subsended all of that stuff, right? Which was like a lot of people suddenly realizing we're so beaten down, we've got more in common with a lion than with a dentist. Yeah, like suddenly you can almost feel this solidarity with a non-human being, right? It's actually perfectly possible to have like some kind of solidarity there. 
you know. Um, I appear to have wandered off the topic, but I haven't, because what I'm actually saying is, is that um, megacities are fantastic ways of thinking, not only ontology, but actually politics, you know. Well, I'm saying that it's, it's possible to imagine solidarity between humans and non-humans. You know, like we've been imagining solidarity between humans. That's quite a nice thing, right? Like you can get together and form a union and stuff. Now it's really cool because you can get together and have a union with like ants and chimps and stuff as well. Right? Now maybe that's the only way Marxism actually works. I'm writing this book for Verso that's trying to like explore that idea. Maybe that's the only way that it really works, actually, I think. Don't get me started on that one. Yeah. Yeah? Actually, yeah. Sorry, I think I was about to uh, get you yeah. started on that. Um, I, I had two maybe observations, uh, then questions in relation, especially to the previous master class, which was also mm. uh, within the kind of triple O camp, but I think very different. The first is that uh, you seem maybe, and I think both probably have to do with the relationship mm. in your own work between the philosophical stuff and the ecological stuff. Mm. But it seems like on the one hand, you're, you don't talk about objects always as objects. You talk about them as syndromes and entities mm. and use other terms, which as, insofar as the relationship between triple O and architecture mm. uh, produces a whole other set of metaphors mm -hmm. that can be appropriated yeah. or dealt with. The second also related is that you start to talk about something that seems like the beginning of a kind of moral philosophy or a, a position yeah. on choice and, a, yeah. and the, the consequences of thought and choice mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of bracketing that. And so I, yeah. I well, right on. very weird. Uh, I understand so, totally what you're asking. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think in, in both yeah. ways, it uh, opens up a different set of questions with respect to how in, yeah. in the discipline of architecture, the, yeah. the kind of discourse of triple O. Would Graham is, punch me right now? Um, no, actually, because like when I, so, okay, so some of us have realized that when you say the word object, you see in that word a mirror, and in that mirror is reflected most of the time your idea, your fantasy projection of the worst possible thing that could happen to you, right, which is being objectified, right, which is one of the worst things that could possibly happen to you, yeah, and so... You know, maybe it would have been cleverer to say entity, right, or thingamajig, or whatever oriented ontology, instead of object oriented ontology, but sort of like it, because it's got O's in it, it looks pretty, you know. Um, and it's provocative, and I like that, and for some reason I'm a very provocative person, who always occupies the devil position in any social setting, um, which is weird and odd, even when I'm trying not to, so I'm probably occupying it now, you know, in some embarrassingly unconscious way that I don't know about. Oh, no, also never mention the unconscious in a group. It's another rule. I just broke it. I'm not talking about your one. I'm talking about other people's, yeah? Um, so, no, when I, when I say, like, when I use words like syndrome, um, I'm actually trying to evoke what OOO is saying about obje ob ob objects. They're not directly metaphysically present, right? You can't point to them directly. You can't access them, right? Um, so I think of lots of different ways of saying the same thing, right? So I think basically I'm saying the same kind of thing. Graham, Harmon and I do have one difference, actually, but it's not there. It's in the, it's in the notion of time. Um, Harmon thinks that there's no past and future. I think there's only past and future, yeah? Because my view is a little bit like an in, inverted version, you know, but it's, but, 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 but it's an inverted version of exactly the same thing. Right, so that's number one, right? So the, what can we learn from this? Object-oriented ontology is a wonderful broad church where all kinds of freaks are tolerated, including Tim, who trained as a deconstructor and actually can't give it up because, like, I love I loved it. I loved it. I loved Derrida. He was my office mate. And I love his stuff, you know, a lot. And I feel like I backed into 2000 through, de through deconstruction. I feel like I've still got the deconstruction vibe. I'm just talking about like spoons and stuff now as well, you know. Um, so that's that, right? 
So number two, point number two, you're absolutely correct. There's a big problem with our modern age, which is that we expect philosophical statements about things to come bundled with some easy to identify, ready to wear politics, so you can relax. Right, like buddy, you, politics of was, oh thank God, reality means you have to be a Maoist. Thank God, at least I know that, right? You can, you, like you can chill. And one of the disturbing things about object-oriented ontology is, is, is that it's actually saying, no, 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 no. Re reality isn't normative. Statements about reality aren't statements about what you should be doing, right? What does that mean? That means something really awesome, actually. That means that you're free to make up any kind of polit politics you want. And in this respect, it is a little bit normative because it's a little bit like anarchism. It's a little bit saying, the point is that whenever you relate to something, which you're doing all the time, you've created a little political setup there, right? There's me and my friend and the toothbrush and who's going to use the toothbrush first and the toothpaste and then what are we going to do, right? And we've got the sink and the toothbrush and the shoes, right? And we form a little collective at that point and we make little decisions. Okay, they're not massive world-changing decisions, but is there a massive world-changing decision? Is there a top-level political form? No, there isn't, because if a political form is real, then it's also one of these object things, and these object things have to be contingent and intrinsically flawed and finite. They just have to be in order to exist, right? And so um, this whole kind of game that we've been playing of, like, let's try and get exactly the right politics to change absolutely everything, you know, please buy my book, isn't necessarily Marxism, actually. That's just the way that we like to be right at the moment, right? And that's not necessarily it, not necessarily. So, you know, I'm sure you could be a conservative object person or a liberal object person or a Marxist object, but I'm a kind of anarchisty Marxist object person, yeah? That's my version of it, yeah? And, um, I think what it's saying quite strongly is that since, you know, since there's no real fundamental like specialness to me being a human, politics obviously includes non-human beings. It's sort of saying that already, but it's obvious, right? You're wearing clothes, you are relating to a non-human being. You've got a shirt on. That's a non-human being, yeah? It's terribly simple. It's incredibly straightforward, right? Non-human beings already in social space, therefore social space is not completely human. Therefore, we have to include non-humans in political decisions. And we sort of do anyway, but anyway, let's do it more consciously, right? So whatever OOO is, it is quite ecological, fundamentally, because it's going against like anthropocentrism, which is the fundamental ecological philosophical move that you need to do to be an ecological person, yeah? It's to go against the idea that there's something incredibly important and special and different about human beings, which makes it okay to let other things go extinct. Thank you very much for the lecture. Um, much of the audience is, is obviously students and, and aspiring architects. Yeah. And, and so maybe this appears, sounds very naive, but as aspiring really? architects, what do we do with this information? Thank you for asking a naive question. When I teach theory class, I, I have a picture of Scooby-Doo. Yeah. The, you know, you can easily Google the kind of one where he's like, Huh? Like the sort of cross-eyed one, like Shaggy's looking over his shoulder, and I think Velma's opening a book, and Scooby's all like, huh? like that, and like that's the theory face, you know. And I say to the undergrads, if you're not making that face, there's something wrong with how I'm teaching. And in fact, that's what we're going to get out of this class is intelligent Scooby-Doo face. That's about as far as you can go. We're not trying to delete that actually. You're not, you're not trying to delete Scooby-Doo's expression when you study philosophy and theory, you're actually trying to be Scooby-Doo. Like Socrates is the ultimate Scooby-Doo character. Yeah? He's like, huh? About everything. Really intelligently, yeah? So thank you for asking that. Um, what, what do we do with this, right? Well, um, there's a kind of slightly cute answer and then there's a slightly less cute answer, right? So I'll give you the cute answer first, um, which is, I'm not paid to make you do stuff. I'm paid to make you be all reflective and twisty and roundy and it's okay to hesitate and, you know, it's okay not to do, not to know what to do because maybe what we've been doing has been destroying Earth, which is actually quite correct, right? So it's not necessarily a totally cute answer. Like, 
ab doing absolutely nothing. I mean, li literally, like, I'm not going to do any more buildings at all, you know, at all, you know, might actually be quite good. You know, at, at least you're not causing any harm. Do you know what I'm saying? But in a rather larger, expanded, remixed sense, you probably sort of are, anyway, doing something and causing some kind of harm. So you have to kind of figure out what to do, right? And what to do with this information is to realize that um, you live in a world where there's no one um, sort of size-fits-all uh, social or political structure, right? There's lots and lots and lots of, I call them toys, right? They're toys. A, th a thing is a toy because it's intrinsically playful, right? And one of the problems with political systems right now is that they're not very playful at all, you know? We, we, we need to seriously introduce some kind of silliness into politics, right? And I'm not talking about the Google version, which is like, what does my friend say? Serious playfulness. Like, if you don't look like you're having fun, you're fired. It's not that kind of. That's like the wrong version, right? What I'm talking about is playful seriousness, right? It's the strategic deployment of quite serious, intense ideas because you can't ever create a one-size-fits-all world, but you can create a some-size-fits-quite-a-lot world, right? And um, you, you know, we've been operating on this principle of trying to find the thing that we have to do, the thing that we have to do. So there's another answer to the question, actually, which is a little bit more intense. And it's not, not at you, but so I'll look at some fantasy person over there while I'm answering it. Because there's a little tiny bit of a good old kind of certain flavor of Christianity, which is a certain flavor of monotheism, kind of in that kind of question. Right, which is like, now I've finished my sermon, you have to go out and do this, this, and this, and then you'll get into heaven, right? Because if you do it all correctly, God, or AKA, an in, you know, who sounds for some reason like me, and is like an invisible version of me with a beard who wants to kill you, mostly, um, like, will approve of you, right? And, you, and so you do all these things, and you're kind of like, I'm trying to get the A from God. If you're in Houston, it's very difficult to talk to people, because some people are trying to get the A from God. They're not actually talking to you. They're being terribly nice and polite and generous, but actually they're like, D -d -d is it okay, is it B plus or A minus? I want to get an A minus. <laughs> Say something else, yeah. Um, so, um, it, so it's not the, it's any, any way I answer the question will have some of that in it. So I just want to draw attention to that, right? Because monotheism is an agricultural product, right? Agriculture, I'm, when I say agriculture, what I mean is Fertile Crescent, China, Africa and Latin America circa 10,000 BC. That mode of agriculture, which I call agri-logistics, which I was outlining, right? Very quickly after it starts, you get the modern world. You get patriarchy within a thousand years. You get the one percent, which in those days was called king, right? You get misery for most people, and you get division of labor, right? And you get this religion thing, Right, you, 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 you go from whatever this kind of dream time first people's spirituality thing is, which is much more like object-oriented ontology, actually, which is another reason why people find it hard to accept, because it's deeply unmodern in some way. That doesn't mean it's retro in particular, but it's like how we've been telling ourselves we aren't for a long time. Um, you uh, substitute whatever that is, you substitute it with... Um, some kind of monotheism where only pr pretty much one person or a couple of people like the Pope or the King or whatever have got like the bat phone to this entity that is no longer in the birds and the trees and the grass. It's this one invisible thing that wants to kill you in the sky, right? Um, and so sort of like, I think of the background of me resisting and having puzzles with this kind of, with, with this question, not you, but with this, because everyone asks it all the time, what are we supposed to do? I do. You know, when I'm reading a book, like, what, what's this telling me to do, you know? Um, somewhere at the back of that, there could possibly be a little bit of a bug in um, the how to relate to non-human beings software. So, so kind of like, so it's not, like I'm not answering it, but like I want to kind of contextualize why I have some feelings about that question. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So one thing to do would be to totally dismantle religion. So what do you, so how do you do that? Well, you know, one solution is to become an atheist, but this is where Richard Dawkins is going to kill me, because obviously you can tell that he has the same belief about belief that fundamentalists do, 
right? Fundamentalists and Richard Dawkins both think that believing means, oh, ah, here's this concept and I'm going to grip it as tightly as possible, ah, like that, right? Um, I think believing is the opposite. It's, uh, believing is like trusting, right? Belief is the opposite, right? I think, right? But you say to Richard Dawkins, you also have a belief the same way. He'd get very angry, which would be like a proof that I was correct, right? So maybe not that, right? This is the other cool thing. I'm, 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 the, I'm the snake oil salesman today of OOO. Only OOO can give you this. It's not true. There's plenty of uh, systems of thought on Earth that can give you this idea. God is irrelevant, right? It's much more energy efficient. You, you can believe in God. You, you don't have to believe in God. God is irrelevant, right? Because even if God exists, she or he or it or they can't be omnipresent and omniscient in an OOO universe, so they don't matter, right? Um, so, there's, so there's no problem, because they, they can't give you an A, and, and you're not being interviewed by them. Even if they exist, I think I'm happier than Richard Dawkins, because I don't have to get really angry when people talk about my beliefs or whatever. Like, I'm, I'm using, I'm like the sort of lithium Prius battery, you know, level of, 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 of uh, thinking about religion. You know, like as low energy as possible. You know, because we're still retweeting this kind of violent, monotheistic thing, even the way atheism is now. So that might be one thing to do, right? So could you build buildings that, like, convince people that, that that was true? That would be awesome, yeah? Like churches, yeah, but not, you know? Unchurches or anti-church, not, not like, yeah, you know, like almost Satanism's a good idea, isn't it? Sometimes I read about it and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm actually a Satanist. <laughs> All my Paris friends think I'm a Satanist. They are Satanists. You know, so they, they would think that, wouldn't they? Hello. Uh, so you have, you have like a philosophy which also has a, a moral project if related to so social ecology and so on. But you sustain that, that moral project uh, with an understanding, like understanding time as some sort of collapse between future and past, mm. and the present as a bunch of singularities created through human perception. So I'd like to know how do you deal with the problem of autonomous choice and decision without falling in skepticism? Oh, yeah. Autonomous choice and decision. Um, OK. Um, well. Um, number one, free, free will is massively overrated. Most of what you do in the world isn't free will, is it? Like, if you were to, if you were to try to drive here, you'd probably kill yourself, right? Like, if you actually just... Driving is like you let the road suck you around, don't you? You, you, you let the other cars tell you where to go, right? That's what we're scared of about objects, is that they remind us about something that we think of as passive. Right? But active and passive are like black and white, and I'm a shades of grey kind of a person. yeah, Because I believe in violating the law of the excluded middle, because that's my irrelevant God-given right or something. And perfectly logical, too, if you cleave to paraconsistent logic, like I do. Um, so... Um, hmm... I've lost the thread, actually. This is the trouble with being a little bit jet-lagged. Restate the very end of your question. Like, because, okay, like, if you're driving or something... Yeah. Like, oh, autonomy. Yeah. See? I'm, I, I, I surrender. I actually made a T-shirt with I surrender written on it. I love this idea of being a little bit more passive than normal. Yeah? And there's a whole politics of radical passivity and all that stuff. Like, it's a, being autonomous is overrated in the political sphere as well, right? Um, the other thing about it is that... Lurking in the back of this idea is the good old Neoplatonic Christian concept of the soul, right? And the soul is a kind of gas or whatever that's like in this kind of bottle over here, right? You know, and because of object-oriented ontology and all that, that can't be true. Um, what's more true is more like in um, the Golden Compass. You know the Golden Compass, right? Like where everything's got like a spirit or daimon or something and it's just off to the left or the right, like just over there. Everything is shadowed by a kind of weird spectral version of itself, right? And we've collapsed this spectrality into something called soul, 
right? And there's a whole bunch of problems that come from that because that's just reification materialism, you know, disguised as something spiritual, right? Um, and it's and fundamentally ni nihilism. It's, it's like what Heidegger says about Christianity. It's Platonism for the masses, right? It's like um, there's this beyond, and the beyond's much more real than here, so we have to somehow dismantle here to get to the beyond. And that infects every single idea we've got, including political ideas, right? Um, and so yeah, I don't think there's that much of a problem. In fact, I'm arguing quite a lot, very perversely, because I'm Mr. Eco guy, that there are these ecological chemicals in consumerism that precisely have to do with relating to things that aren't you for no reason at all, which is the kind of energy you need to be able to be nice to polar bears. There's no good reason to be nice to polar bears. You just have to love them, right? And like, you know, there's no good reason to drink Coke instead of Pepsi. Like the Pope isn't telling you that you'll be executed if you drink Coke instead of Pepsi. You just sort of do because you like it. And you're in a sort of loop with this fantasy thing that you think of when you, when you think about Coca-Cola, you know? And the Coke bottle's sort of telling you how to hold it, right? Like that everyone knows who takes drugs. It's the, they tell you how to consume them, right? They, there's a whole kind of drink me, eat me thing about drugs that, and drugs are obviously like on the top level of consumerism because the top level of consumerism since the Romantic period when it started has to do with consuming experience itself as a spiritual type of a thing, right? And so funnily enough, um, there's something that we can learn from this phase of reality, and like a lot of Marxism is very resistant to this idea, which is a shame. Some isn't, and some is, right? I've, I've, I've read Zizek saying not being resistant to it, right? But there's a, we have to pass through this phase of commodity form. That's how they would put it, right? How I would put it, um, we need to start like realizing that we're already caught in all kinds of relationships with things that aren't us already, and then we're not in charge of that, you know, and that's actually good, like, we need to kind of go through that, so, like, I'm not necessarily saying there's no autonomy, all I'm saying is, right now, it's politically expedient to actually pull the fader down on the autonomy fader, right, and have something else be f louder than that, somehow, because we've got, like, buggy ideas about what autonomy is that come from Neoplatonic Christianity, which is, like, how to be George Bush. Right, he's a Neoplatonic Christian. Yeah. Dr. Morton, uh, mm. thank you. I am looking forward to a weekend of suspending oh. my modern obligations. Hooray. Um, hey. Or my obligations to modernity. And um, so, uh, thank you. Oh, thank and, you. And uh, we resume for the class. We resume tomorrow morning at cool. 10 a.m. Yeah. And um, there's events going on as well this weekend, so I urge everyone to be involved at the SciArc events and to definitely, on Friday night, see the close-up um, exhibit as well. So thank you, Dr. My Martin. pleasure. See you soon.